How's everyone doing? Everyone good? Yeah. yeah, I want to make sure that everyone's good. All right. Are we sure we all good? Yeah. Perfect. Yes. So I'm Fuso DG. Um, I'm a musician. I have a, a lot of passion for Africa. Everything I pretty much do is for Africa. Um, but yeah, I guess, you know, when I got asked to do this talk, to me it was brainer for me to come and share the vision um, with you guys because a lot of you guys know that as well as the music I'm also very vocal about our people moving forward um, as one so Fuso DG I grew up in I was born in London uh, but I grew up in Ghana and also grew up in London as well so um, you know I had uh, the unique um, uh, upbringing of you know growing up as a child in Ghana and also growing up as a child um, in London. Being in Ghana, I was a free child, you know, playing around with other kids barefoot in Ashtown, Kumase. Where are my Ashanti people at? <laughs> in Ashtown, Kumase, just playing football in the streets in the road. If there's a car coming, we might not move, move we might just move, the car has to wait. <laughs> Even though we're like, we're like eight year olds, you know, nine year olds playing in the streets you know, freely. Um, and, you know, it got to a point where things got a bit hard for my parents, so they moved us to, um, to London um, around the time I was around 11. And uh, when I got to London, I kind of, everything kind of changed for me. I went from being this child to being a black child. And I didn't just go to be a black child, I became a black African child. Um, and it was very confusing for me as a child because then now everywhere that we go, we're filling out a form. There's a section where you have to tick what your ethnicity is. You know, so if you're black African, you tick that. If you're black Caribbean, you tick that. If you're Asian, you tick that. If you're white British, you tick that. And I realized that every single box that you have to tick has a certain perception attached to it. Um, and for black African, I found out the hard way in school that nobody in my school really respected Africa. Um, and one of my first interactions when we got to my secondary school, Lanfranc in Croydon, um, the teacher looked, saw my name and she saw Nana Richard Abiona and she said to my mom that they would prefer to call me Richard instead of Nana because she don't want the kids to tease me when, you know, when we were in school. And I was very confused because growing up in Ghana, Nana means king. You know, if you're a boy, king. If you're a girl, queen. I really wanted to be called Nana. Um, so it was a battle between my mom and the teacher. My mom actually let it go. So now I'm in, I'm in school as Richard. <laughs> but my nose and my lips say I'm Nana. So I still didn't get away from being cussed by the kids, saying, oh, you have a big nose, you have a big lips. And, and my accent is so strong, you know, I still couldn't get away from trying to fit in. Um, you know, so it was very confusing being in school and still having fights with people because I'm trying to back myself. Um, and what was worse was some of the kids that were actually teasing me were black kids who were of a, a, a Caribbean background or Jamaican, but they disassociated themselves from Africa so much that to me, I am so different from them that it made it so much easier for them to cuss me, even though Ashley had the same nose as me and Jermaine had the same lips as me. You know, um, and <laughs> what even made it more worse was, excuse my grammar, English is not my first language, so. <laughs> what made it even worse was when I saw another Ghanaian who was acting like he was Jamaican cussing me. <laughs> I was so confused <laughs> because I'm looking, at, I'm looking at him and your name is Trumacy. <laughs> and, 
and your name is Boating, and you're acting like you're Jamaican, you know, and, and almost looking at me like, like I know, but we're looking at each other like we're just going to act like we're Jamaican, like, but I can't get away with it because, you know, I've got an African accent, and it, it was just so hard as a child trying to fit in, and, you know, I did my best, you know, trying to get on with people, um, so I can get on with my, with my education. I had a great time in school, I'm not going to lie, but as I was losing my accent, I was losing myself as an African. Um, so over the years, as I was, you know, getting my British accent, I was losing my African heritage. And, you know, it, 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 it was very tricky being a child in secondary school and trying to survive in school to make sure that everybody's cool with you. Um, and at the time, I was also very passionate about making music. So I was already in love with music, and I was learning how to make music, you know, in my bedroom. And then I would take the songs, and I would bring it to school. And then people would start thinking I'm the cool kid now. So I started becoming cool through the music. You know, so Ashley, Jermaine, everybody's coming to my house now to make music with me. So I started becoming cool to these kids. And, um, you know, somehow, yeah, managed to get through to secondary school. And I had to, you know, of course, I was doing the music. But I still had to focus, obviously, on education. African parents, I can't tell them that I want to I wanna be a rapper. You know? <laughs> At the time, Afrobeats wasn't hot, so I can't exactly say I want to be an Afrobeats artist. You know? So focusing on my education from college to uni. And what was so interesting is when I got to college, I felt there was a lot more Africans there. I don't know whether the Jamaicans didn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> A low blow, guys. Trust me, I'll, I'll just give you facts. So, my, my manager is Jamaican, by the way. So, yeah, there was a lot more Africans in college going through to uni. So, and it's like we're kind of coming back to who we truly were because there was more Afrobeats coming through now. We're hearing people like Mo Hits, Two Ds, you know, coming out with these bangers that were so cool that we can openly start dancing to it in front of people. Um, so we all started having conversations about just being African and we, we're no longer hiding our accents. We're making jokes in like, we're calling each other Chale. Like I'd never heard Chale since like my mom or my dad trying to tell me like not to call him Chale. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so it was quite interesting going through college and uni and hearing this exciting music coming from the motherland. And it, it, it gave me this, this, this thirst and this love to want to go back home and actually soak in this music that I keep hearing so I can actually make music like that. Um, so, you know, I spoke to um, my manager, at the well, my friend at the time, who's now my manager, that I want to go Ghana, like, you know, there's this guy that I want to work with, you know, his, his name is Killbeat. I went on Twitter and I messaged him um, about working together and I was shocked because at the time I didn't have no hits and he still replied to me and, you know, uh, uh, said we can work. So got my money together, hustling, got my funds together, flew to Ghana by myself, um, went to meet Killbeat. And when I landed, the joy that I felt, the beauty that I saw, the richness in the culture, the food, the amazing people, the, the talent, the creativity, I was mind blown and I felt so tricked by the media that's been telling our story in such a negative way over in the UK and or, or in the US or, or, or Holland or, you know, anywhere outside of Africa. You know, our story has been so negative where I'm sitting there watching TV in the UK and there's these kids with flies around their mouth um, uh, uh, or fly on their nose and every year they manage to replicate this shot with the same fly with a, a different kid. <laughs> I don't know how they train these flies to be so loyal to them. <laughs> These flies are so loyal to them that every year they come back. <laughs> it was quite impressive, actually, uh, the strategy that they used to, um, to raise money to help to save us. Um, so, you know, I felt really tricked by that narrative. Um, and as I was falling in love back with myself, with the motherland, with the music, you know, I was seeing so many different things. One of the things that I was seeing was just down the street or driving past down the street and see the market sellers dancing. They're just, they're just dancing. They're just, I don't, there's no music playing, but they're dancing. 
go to church, everybody dancing, crazy. Go to the club, but they're doing this specific dance. Um, and I kept asking, what, what dance is this? I kept asking, everybody's like, shall I make you no worry, man, it's a low car dance. I'm like, bro, I wanna know what this dance is. They said, it's a zonto. I go, okay, nice, like, I used to teach me how to do it. And I'm not really a dancer, but this dance was so infectious that I, I couldn't wait to come back to the UK and show my friends. I couldn't wait to come back to the UK and just let everybody know, like, look at this new dance that I've learned in Ghana. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I found this new love for Africa uh, um, and I just couldn't contain it and I felt like I needed to do something to package this dance and, and, and make a song with it. So, you know, I spoke to Kilby about it and then we made a song. It's Fuse! I just came back from Ghana and I want to share this dance that everyone's doing over there. Kilby tried to show me how to do this. It's Fuse! <laughs> See, I just came back from Ghana. Basically. And I want to share this dance that everyone was doing over there. What's the dance? Cubie tried to show me how to do it. If you don't know. He sat me down in this place. And what do you say? And he said to me, me. Nobody wanna see you rising And when they do, they don't even like it They just wanna see you deep in crisis Drive us off, you don't need the license Holler her, she can even ride it Go ahead, move your feet just like this Then he showed me the latest We walk over the haters I want you to do my Zunto 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 And this song was made just from my experience of being in Ghana. We shot the video, uploaded it, millions of views straight away. <laughs> and that trip back to Ghana changed my whole life. And from selling millions of records, touching millions of lives, working with all of my heroes from Wyclef Jean to Damien Marley to Sean Paul to Ed Sheeran um, to winning Marlboro Awards 2014, 15 and 16 and in 2018, QBs and I being the first Ghanaians to ever win a Grammy for working on Sheeran's Ooh. Divide album. So. <laughs> you know, so we found gold. I found gold coming back home. Yeah. And I packaged it to the world. You know, there's so much gold that we have in the motherland. There's so much gold that we have in Ghana. And in these years of return, not just one year of return, <laughs> because we can't just do one year of return and then go. We have to come and build. So in these years of return, I hope that you can find your gold. You can find your own happiness. You can find your own peace coming back on your pilgrimage to the motherland, I hope you can find your own happiness and hope that you can find your own happiness um, being in the motherland because whether you like it or not, today's day is 18th of December, 2019, what's the time? So 18th of December, 2019, 3.44, right now we are all a part of a beautiful revolution that's happening right now. A revolution of mind, a revolution of self-love. All our people are coming back home. Even though a lot of us are coming to turn up, turn up, we're still, <laughs> we're still coming to get inspired. We're still coming to invest. We're still coming to build. So right now, this has never happened in history before. In, in Ghana, in the history of Ghana, we are all witnessing a revolution of self-love. So. Everybody coming back home, you need to pat yourself on the back because you are part of history right now. So I want everybody to pat themselves on the back. Right now. <laughs> so. <laughs> so looking back, looking back from where I was coming from in London and how I, I wanted to distance myself from Africa because there were so many negative images. To me, that was a serious case of, of self-hate. Um, and to be honest, I don't even blame, you know, a lot of the kids for teasing me because I guess we're all victims of this mental programming um, that we've been, uh, we've been under, you know, uh, over in the UK or in the US or uh, in the Netherlands or France or wherever you're from. And the psychological effects of these influences this mental programming is massive 
and we shouldn't take it very lightly because even for me, I grew up in Kumase, but yet when I stepped into London and spent some years in London, I still moved myself away from Africa because I wanted to fit in. So I can't imagine what my brothers and sisters are going through in America, you know, where they've been taken from this soil right here, this soil where everybody is sitting, they've been taken from here to another land for over 400 years and been under oppression, um, been under all sorts of madness and with little, um, uh, uh, with little attachment to the motherland or with little reasons for them to come to the motherland. I can't imagine how distant they must be from who they're really supposed to be and who they acting like they are. You know, because even for me, even though I grew up in Ghana, I still did it. So I have to salute all my brothers and sisters who are still coming back home from America and from all these places that they were taken to and actually just ripped off of their, their, their identity and their self-pride and they're still coming back home to actually experience where they're from. So round of applause if you're coming from America. So it's going to take a long time before we can actually undo and unlearn so we can relearn uh, because of this, this mental programming that we've been under. But if you take anything away from this talk today, um, and if you want to understand what this New African Movement is about, you know, we pretty much base it on three principles, and it's love, knowledge, and power. You guys have heard the saying, knowledge is power, but the only way to seek knowledge is through love. You guys hear that? I feel like I'm in church right now. <laughs> You've heard knowledge is power, but the only way to seek knowledge is through love, because if you love something, you want to know about it. If you love something, you want to know about it, you want to fight for it, you want to protect it, whether it's a person, whether it's a place, or whether it's a force team or a basketball team. So if you're a fan of Manchester United, you know, you want to know what the scores were. You want to know what players were sold. You want to know why your team is not doing well. So if we manage to develop this kind of love for Africa, that's the same kind of passion. We'll have players fighting for Africa. So to me, it's very important that we develop this love in order to have this thirst for the knowledge. And then that's when this knowledge is power can actually make sense. Um, and with this new thirst of knowledge that I have for Africa, it's helped me identify different things that we've been going through from our people in, in America, in the UK, in France, Australia, everywhere, uh, and in Africa as well. Um, there's some global themes that um, we need to really identify, and one of them is um, lack of leadership. You know, our history was taught so wrongly from a wrong perspective that it's, it's so easy for you to disconnect from it because they said we were slaves. They didn't say that we were doctors, we were creatives, you know, kings and queens, and then they enslaved us. But when we read the way they taught me in school, they said we were slaves. When they captured the slaves, no, when they captured the king, when they captured the doctors, you know, they like to dehumanize it. So that way it's so, it's so much easier for us to accept the story that they feed us. You know, so... It's, 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 it's very important that with this new thirst of knowledge that we have, we tackle all these issues. So lack of, lack of leadership, um, skin bleaching. <laughs> the global standard of beauty, you know, as we know now, you know, they, they've been telling us that it's white or light. So it made us sisters and brothers uncomfortable to, to, to feel comfortable in their own skin, in their dark complexion. And, and big up um, with the Miss World for, for, for winning from South Africa, right? Was it the Miss Universe? I get, I get confused between Miss Universe and Miss World. But big up Jamaica for winning Miss, Miss World and big up South Africa for winning Miss Universe. And it's, it's about time that we started changing that narrative of what real beauty is. Um, and again, it's only a thirst for knowledge and love for Africa would make us want to think about these things and work on it. Please killing us. That's another issue that's a global issue for all of us that we need to come together and discuss and stand up against 
our own people killing each other. <laughs> Again, that's another issue that we need to stand up and fight against. High level of mental health, mental health issues across our communities. Again, if we love Africa, if we love ourselves, we'll come together and we'll find solutions for these things. High level of incarceration. You know, all of these are issues that we need to address as Africans. But before we can do that, we, every black person needs to see themselves as an African. That's the only way we can all come together and fight this so it doesn't feel like when, America, when black Americans are suffering, it's not just about black lives matter, it's about African lives matter. You know, it's about all of us fighting together and making sure that we're finding solutions for what we're going through. So for me, as a creative, I feel like it's my responsibility to create a platform that will help to change the world's mental image of how they see Africa. And this is how we'll be able to develop this love that we need. So if you're a musician, if you're a, a, a filmmaker, any creative, if you're an entrepreneur, whatever you're doing, you need to make sure that it's something that promotes um, a, a sense of, of pride and identity for our people and making them feel proud of who they are and not shame. You know, so that's very important for every creative, whatever you're doing, let's make sure that whatever we're doing, it, it, it pushes the agenda of changing the world's mental image of what Africa is supposed to be. Um, I actually really, I loved Black Panther. You know, it, it, Black Panther came and it changed the whole game. Everybody, you know, I was wearing African attire like a couple of days before, and then after Black Panther, the day after, everyone was like, Wakanda. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> This is Fuso DG fam. <laughs> you know, but it was a beautiful thing, you know, seeing everybody being proud of who they are and screaming Wakanda when they hear Africa. Rather than thinking um, war, poverty, and people dying, they're thinking Wakanda, they're thinking vibranium strength, they're thinking royalty, they're thinking kings, they're thinking queens. You know, things were really changing with uh, uh, filmmakers now changing the narratives for us. And for me, with this new love that we have, we have to take actions in order to create this new reality and we have to be very aware of what's happening socially, uh, politically and also economically um, as a people. And one of the practical examples I wanted to share with you guys was um, uh, I was in Ghana one time and um, I saw this billboard and it was a, a picture of a woman rubbing cream on her skin and as she rubbed it you can see that her skin is getting lighter. You know, and I was confused because it was a global company that's, um, that was doing this campaign in Accra. So, again, with the love that I have for Africa, I got angry straight away. I said, no, nah, they can't come to my country and try and make my people bleach themselves. Like, I was like, yo, Mr. Hackett, what are going on? <laughs> like, I was like, no, nah, we have to create awareness of this. We have to stop this. So I actually done a post on Instagram that went viral and everybody started reposting and then going on their page to complain, contacting them, calling them, getting their products, flushing it down the toilet and showing them that we don't need your products. We're not going to give you our money if you're going to come to the motherland and tell us to bleach our skin. You know, so it was a very powerful campaign because three days later, these guys managed to take down all the billboards, not just in Accra, but across the whole of Africa, every single billboard came down. Yeah. And when that happened, I was very inspired by that whole movement and the power within the people. And I, I learned one of the biggest lessons in people and power. So we can run around doing, you know, protesting with our Black Lives Matter banners saying that, you know, things need to change, Black Lives Matter. But we need to speak their language. We need to know the power have with our spending power and our buying power. We need to start saying no to these people. You know, if we're going to seek justice with these people in power, we have to speak their language. We have to stop giving our money to them. You know, so instead of going to Vegas, everybody come across. Instead of going to Miami, go to Lagos. Instead of going to Ibiza, go to Nairobi. Instead of going to Paris, go to Kigali. 
And this is the kind of thought process and, and, and energy that we need to have as a people, you know. Um, instead of buying Gucci, <laughs> let's buy our own brand. Instead of buying Barbie dolls, buy Nana dolls. <laughs> I'm Fuso DJ and this is New Africa. It's Fuso!